Ladies and gentlemen, would everyone please take their seats? So get everybody in, get the door closed. You don't want to miss this. All right. We, uh, our next speaker, one of my favorites, has that perfect combination of humor, courage, intelligence, and enthusiasm for the great outdoors. How can you not love a woman who, A, had a video blog series named Ham Nation, B, routinely smacked down Juan Williams on the O'Reilly Factor, and C, climbed Mount Kilimanjaro on her honeymoon? Let's give an enthusiastic Rocky Mountain welcome to Mary Catherine Ham. Hi guys. Can you hear me? Hey everyone. We got you. We got you, Mary Catherine. Okay, just making sure. <laughs> hey, I very much wish that I could be there in the room with you in beautiful Colorado. I am on the East Coast instead, uh, stuck here awaiting a flight that might not happen to Tampa, depending on how the weather looks. Uh, I really wish I could be out there with you guys. It became a, a, a traveling issue and I couldn't make it, but I hope to make it to beautiful Steamboat Springs ASAP because I love being out in Colorado. I love that the speed limit is 75. You don't see that on the East Coast. Uh, <laughs> I love the people out there. And as uh, my very kind introduction from Jennifer mentioned, uh, thank you for that. I, uh, I like to do a 14er every now and then. So uh, I, I plan to come out there more often in the future and maybe collect a few of those. Uh, maybe I'll do it with Paul Ryan. I can interview him while I'm doing it. Um, I wanted to talk to you guys today a little bit about where we are in the campaign as of now. Um, I don't know about you guys. I feel a little exhausted sometimes because I think there's a reason for that. We've been through a lot of conversations during this campaign. Uh, you may notice that the media once a week wants to have a national conversation about something. Well, here's my theory on politics junkies, uh, like you and like me. We're not super normal people. We're a little odd, and that's okay. I'm comfortable with that. You should be comfortable with it too. Uh, but what we are, I think, when people look at us is, have you ever met a really, really super dedicated Days of Our Lives fan, or similar soap opera. That is what we are. When it comes to politics, we are watching the show every single day, and we are trying to convince normal people that something really exciting is happening every single day, right? Sometimes they don't believe us, and it takes a lot of convincing. To them, they go, I don't know, I feel like I could tune in four years from now, and everything would look the same. Stefano would still be locking up Marlena, and everything would be the same on Days of Our Lives. Um, so it sometimes can be hard to connect uh, and, and make people understand what's going on. I think this year, it's been even more chaotic than usual. Are, does it feel to you a lot like we're talking about the economy frequently? Or does it feel like you, to you like we're talking about some random issue once a week? Uh, I think that's what we've been doing a lot of. And it's the media is interested in doing that. The Obama campaign is interested in doing that. And that's why we end up doing that. Here's the thing about a national conversation. It is neither national nor a conversation. That's the key thing to remember. In fact, what you should also remember is the first person who asks to have a national conversation uh, is probably the least likely to actually want to have a conversation. Here's what I mean. It's not national because the entire discussion happens between Debbie Wasserman Schultz and an anchor on MSNBC. You're not part of it. Normal people are not part of that conversation. And it's not a conversation because only one side is allowed to express itself. For instance, let's look at famous national conversations we've had in the past. Uh, the Duke lacrosse case 
comes to mind. In the case of the Dupla Cross case, the national conversation required that you ignore the facts of the investigation, that you not hold off on judging whoever was named as the properly politically correct suspect, uh, and that we just move along and condemn people without actually looking at the facts. Uh, the Skip Gates incident, where Barack Obama said that the police acted stupidly uh, in their interactions with the Harvard professor, another example where we were called to condemn somebody immediately without actually looking at the facts. And in fact, the assertion from the media is that you are somehow bigoted if you actually would like to look at the facts. So I think that's a cycle that we have been stuck in during this campaign. Let me give you a couple of examples. Um, one, <laughs> we, oh, I wanted to mention this one, the Tucson shooting. Perfect example of a national conversation where the media and the left came to a conclusion and we were just required to sit there and not defend ourselves. The shooter in that case had nothing to do with a political motivation. It's been proven since then, but because it was helpful to blame Tea Partiers, we ended up having a silly, uninformed, uh, prejudicial to our fellow citizens national conversation about the Tucson shooting. And I think this year we've seen a lot of that. We've had a national conversation about fried chicken in which only one side is allowed to express itself. We've had um, a national conversation about whether Mitt Romney causes cancer. <laughs> that one, by the way, comes to us from the same campaign that brought us the national conversation about toning down our rhetoric after the Tucson shooting. There's the great irony there. Um, we've also had a national conversation about exactly which periods of time Mitt Romney was at Bain Capital doing what particular work. Uh, the fact that the entire nation has studied this timeline at this point uh, is pretty insane given the big issues in front of us. But to be fair to the Obama campaign, it's pretty hard to find anybody else with a job to talk about. <laughs> so, um, I just think that this gets us into a cycle where we're not dealing with what the actual issues are. In fact, I would argue at the end of this summer, which I think, I think we might be turning a corner here on the silly season, at the end of this summer, Mitt Romney and the right and conservatives gave Obama and the left and the media the chance to have the adult conversation that they so desperately wish to have, we are led to believe. How did we do this? Mitt Romney named Paul Ryan to the ticket. He is the person, he is the politician who is brave enough to have a plan. He is the opposite of Barack Obama's reaction to the Simpson Bowles deficit commission. Uh, he addresses very serious issues that are very hard to talk about and are very politically scary to talk about. For instance, Medicare. Now, what happened in the week after Paul Ryan was named to the ticket? The Democrats are allegedly super excited to talk about Medicare because they know we're going to lose this issue. The media is allegedly super excited to talk about Medicare because they want to address very serious issues. And three days after Ryan was on the ticket, we were having a national conversation about A, Mitt Romney's tax returns again, and B, whether Paul Ryan, as a conservative, is allowed to be a fan of Rage Against the Machine. There you have it. That's where that went pretty daggone quickly. And I think we may have hit a point where we can turn a corner here. Um, let's look at where, where we've come. Because of this summer of barrage of ridiculous stories. I would also note that um, when a shooter who very likely had political uh, motives and implications to it, when he went into the Family Research Council and shot a security guard in what looks like a politically motivated shooting, 
Curious, we did not have a national conversation about that, did we? Yet you'll remember in 2009, we had a lot of conversation about how impolite Tea Partiers might possibly call, cause the downfall of the union. The double standard is breathtaking. It always has been, it will continue to be. But I do think that we have a chance to move in a different direction moving forward. I say that because, well, first of all, Barack Obama has gone through $120 million in negative ads this summer. Uh, thanks to my good friend, John Podhoritz, who writes for the New York Post, uh, I have the stat that John McCain, just for comparison's sake, spent $75 million in the general election in 2008. So $120 million this summer versus $75 million spent by McCain last time the entire election. Um, and where are we? Well, the most recent Fox poll shows Mitt Romney up by two, 45-43. Recent Quinnipiac polling out of Wisconsin, Paul Ryan's home state, shows improbably that folks there are moving in his direction. He's gotten a significant bump in that state, which should be a pretty, it's, it's a battleground state, but it should lean blue. And it's now gone to toss up. Um, and then, also improbably, the Barack Obama campaign has had to be on defense about Medicare. They have been winning this issue since the day the program was created. They have been scaring people into not talking about it. And this time around, seniors took a look at Paul Ryan and decided he was the cutest bingo caller they'd ever seen, and they weren't going to fret about it. And there's something powerful there. Winning an unexpected argument that you weren't sure you could win. I would argue that the Wisconsin labor dispute was the same thing. A year or two ago, I would have said, man, they're gonna spend so much money and so much time and fight so viciously that there's no way Scott Walker can hang on. But he did, and he did with impressive support from union households who looked around them and said, they told us the sky was gonna fall, the left did, and it didn't. Teachers aren't getting fired. In fact, they're being able, we were able to keep them on because we had this discussion. Um, so I think they cried wolf in that situation. I think they're doing the same thing with Mitt Romney. And the question is, of course, uh, whether people will believe them. But I think we're poised to win some arguments. I think the entire Barack Obama presidency has been a very interesting educational experience. Isn't that a nice way for me to put it? For, <laughs> for all of us, but not only for activists. I think what has been most interesting to me, when I got to Washington, D.C., when I started my career there in 2004 or five. And I found out that people didn't read the bills they voted on. And I thought, that's crazy. Someone's lying to me. That can't be true. Well, of course it is true. It's just that you don't know it until you see the beast up close and all of its horribleness. <laughs> so I think what happened in the healthcare debate, and you guys saw this message and took it forward, is that Barack Obama wanted to pass that piece of legislation within a month and a half. Nobody would have seen anything. The negotiations would not have happened on C-SPAN, despite the fact that he promised they would. It would have gone very quickly, giant bill, boom, we move on. What happened was people like you, who became aware of what was going on, slowed down that process so much that you could really actually see the sausage being made. And it is not pretty. And the rest of America saw it too. A lot of conservatives said, yes, this is what happens all the time. But it was an opportunity for more people to see that and really get acquainted with, look, this is how the system works. 
This is how it's co-opted by different people. This is how people who know nothing about healthcare write an entire bill that will turn our system upside down. Um, those things were new information to people. I think we continue to have an opportunity to educate people about the fiscal situation we're in, about just how gigantic the federal government is, which I, I don't think people really understand a lot of the time. For instance, I don't think they understand that when in Washington we say a cut to a program, what we mean is a decrease in its future growth, meaning it will never be smaller than it is today. But if you threaten to make it grow slower than it is projected to grow, that equals a cut. That is just not English or plain sense. That is Washington. And it's our opportunity to teach people those dirty little secrets. And I think having Paul Ryan on the ticket is a really good segue to having those discussions. Um, sitting here at the end of the summer, as far as likability goes, which has always been a, a uh, certainly a challenge for Mitt Romney, and obviously somewhere where Barack Obama soars, people just like him. And that's something you have to deal with in your campaign strategy. The barrage of negative campaigning from Barack Obama, the does Mitt have give cancer ads and such <laughs> from that side, um, have taken a toll. A uh, Gallup poll just this week showed uh, that 44% of voters think that Obama is attacking Romney unfairly. 40% of voters think the same thing of Romney. So it's close, but Obama, who's allegedly the most likable politician of our time, is four points ahead of him when it comes to people judging him as unfairly attacking. So that is not a bad place to start your pitch at your convention, I would argue. Mitt Romney hasn't had a lot of chances to give a national, like nationally televised, really important, really high profile speech that a lot of people will be watching. Um, I think there's an opportunity for him there. I think there's an opportunity for Ann Romney, who is incredibly likable, uh, to really knock one out of the park. And most of all, there's an opportunity for us on the right and the Republicans at the convention to have a convention where we really do have an adult conversation about what we're facing, where we really do have a conversation about whether we built that and whether we want to continue building things in the future and whether we want to encourage people who are entrepreneurs and who are brave and take risks or whether we want to denigrate those qualities and possibly discourage them in generations to come. I think we have an opportunity to have that discussion. And on the other side, right after the Republicans are done, the assumption is, or it looks like it's, it's winding up to be three days on abortion and gay marriage in North Carolina from the podium for the Democrats, which I am not sure is a great calculation for them. If you look at the actual numbers on abortion, for instance, the media thinks this is a hugely problematic issue for Republicans. And I would argue it is if we shoot ourselves in the foot and say dumb things about it. But in general, the issue is about a 50-50 issue, depending on what poll you're looking at. And 40% of independents consider themselves pro-life. So I'm not sure that making that the center of your convention is a good idea. That making Sandra Fluck the symbol of all that you embody is a great idea. Speaking of which, I loved the national conversation we had this summer about how Republicans allegedly want to turn back the clock on women to the dark, dark ages of three months ago when they had to pay a small monthly fee for birth control sometimes. Like, <laughs> that's the allegation, that allegedly three months ago, birth control became some sort of human right that you could not possibly fork over 10 to $30 a month for. It's ridiculous. Oh, and I forgot the national conversation about this. 
this is my favorite one, perhaps. The national conversation about how things that Barack Obama just decided make him super enlightened while it makes the rest of us cretins. For instance, he evolves on gay marriage in the middle of the summer. A month later, we're having a discussion where we vilify Chick-fil-A for holding the exact same beliefs Barack Obama held up until one month earlier. Anyway, I, I do think we have a chance to really draw a line and say, yes, we're going to have the discussion about the economy. We're going to have the discussion uh, about jobs and about our debt. Because the thing about this summer of nonsense in many ways is that at the end of it, what are still the top two issues in every single poll? Jobs in the economy, debt and deficit. They're not moving the needle on these things. And birth control as a human right is not going to creep up into the top two anytime soon, I don't think. What they're calculating is that they need a giant, giant proportion of women to vote for them. Uh, and so as with all these other constituencies, they're carving out little treats for each one. Granted, that's sort of an easier way to campaign. Hey, I'll give you free stuff if you vote for me. We don't have that luxury. We have to go to people and say, look, I know there, there are tough choices we make ahead, but in order to sustain ourselves as a country, we have to deal with the actual facts instead of having a fight about fried chicken once every three weeks. That is not the path to prosperity. <laughs> and it's going to be an interesting contrast in the next couple of weeks. And I think it's, we always face the challenge of a media that wants to do what Barack Obama wants it to do. Uh, Mark Halperin uh, said as much, Time Magazine reporter, said as much this week, I believe on, um, on Morning Joe, on MSNBC at some point, said that he just admitted, yes, the press is very susceptible to doing exactly what Barack Obama wants them to do. That means that we do a lot of filling in the gaps. You and I talking to neighbors, talking to friends. That's why we have to educate ourselves about Paul Ryan's plan because half the time the anchor on your evening news is not going to bother to do that. Uh, and that's why people were concerned when he was added to the ticket. Maybe this is too much to explain. Maybe people won't understand it. And I think the first couple of weeks showed that, in fact, it's Barack Obama who's afraid of the explaining. And we and Paul Ryan have done pretty daggone good. <laughs> so congratulate yourselves on that, by the way. And finally, I have, I have a theory. Um, about Barack Obama and, uh, and what he wants to end up being. I've always thought maybe, just maybe, uh, he really doesn't want to be president so much as he wants to be a Democratic ex-president. Hear me out. Being president right now is not very fun. Uh, the economic situation, not great. He doesn't want to talk about any of the issues that are actually on his plate. Uh, I think he signed up for something he's not great at. But especially when you're looking at the contrast between being who he is right now and dealing with all that stuff and being a Democratic ex-president, which may be the greatest job in the entire world. You get paid millions of dollars for everyone to fall at your feet in every destination you go to. Please see Bill Clinton. Uh, and all I'm saying is that I think it's a good fit for him, and we should help him get there. Now, I apologize. I'm actually I'm having a little bit of uh, trouble hearing you guys, so if I was like, 
rushing a little bit. I, I didn't mean to not give you time to react, but I could hear you a couple times, but I'm having a little bit of, of trouble. I do, I would love to do some Q&A. Um, is that possible since I'm having a little trouble hearing, Rick? Oh, yes. You can, we okay. can do Q&A just fine. Um, okay. And I, I love Q&A, so I know I'm, I've left a little bit of time here, um, but I wanted to check and make sure that that was possible. So. Yep, absolutely. Do you want to go to Q&A now or do you have some more before? Actually, I'd love to because I, I, um, I can go Barack Obama style and filibuster you guys forever. I'm just kidding. I, no, I'm just <laughs> Okay, well, Dr. Hoffmeister here is going to, uh, to get the people to ask you the questions. They're going to stand right here where I am looking at the camera. Um, I, I'll ask the first question because I'm very politically incorrect, and I know these good people are uh -oh. much too polite to ask this question. How is it that you avoid killing Juan Williams? <laughs> Weird, I never get that question. Anybody um, else? Come up. He, um, actually, Juan, I, I actually really, really, really love working with Juan. Um, and I, I will tell you, have any of you guys ever met him in real life? A lot of folks that have, that I've been to these events with have actually met him in real life. Um, super sweet guy. The thing I like about Juan, um, and yes, we, uh, we generally disagree, but the thing I like about Juan, and this is not true of a lot of people who go on TV. I mean, frankly, sometimes it can be your job to go there and spit out whatever the DNC sent you that day, right? Um, Juan, especially the two of us together, because we've become friends, he is not trying to pull the wool over my eyes. He's not trying to, uh, he's not trying to lie about something that the DNC sent out. Like, do I think he's wrong sometimes? And does he think I'm wrong sometimes? Yes. But the, uh, it's a lot more fun to be on TV when you know the two of you are trying to tell each other the truth instead of trying to lie to each other. Like you can have an honest debate there in the middle and a lot of people will just go on TV and make stuff up. And I just kind of sit there like, <laughs> which is not the most effective response. I need to work on that. But uh, it's nice to be on with somebody who, who truly is, like, he's an honest broker. And like, I think he's wrong sometimes, but he's a good person and I, I appreciate that. And yes, occasionally we, we, sh we shoot uh, O'Reilly in two studios right next to each other. Um, and then we walk out of the doors and see each other as soon as we're done. And so sometimes I walk out like huffing and puffing and throwing things and uh, <laughs> He takes it rather well. Um, we're, we're buddies at the end of the day. Go ahead, Mary. Hi, my name is, I'm Mary Catherine. Hey there. I'm not standing in the right position. There we go. Oh, hi. I'm right here. Hi, Mary Catherine. Thank you very much. Your talk was great, and we're sorry you're not here with us. Um, I'm from Wisconsin, and I know you mentioned Paul Ryan several times. And we conservatives in Wisconsin are very proud of the fact that Paul Ryan is from our state. We also have a lot of other things to be proud of, um, Senator Ron Johnson. And also, last but not least, we defeated the unions against yes. a recall. <laughs> For our great governor, Scott Walker. So. The conservative movement is alive and well in Wisconsin, and we have a lot of hopes for Paul Ryan. And I thank you for mentioning him so many times. Sure. Um, in Wisconsin, we like to think that we go toward the sound of the guns <laughs> instead of away from it. And we call ourselves Ground Zero. For the last two years, we've been very busy. Definitely. So we're ready. We're ready for November. Um, Rick stole my question. <laughs> But I'll phrase one. it just a little bit differently. Yeah. Um, when you and Juan are on at the same time, oh, Bill O'Reilly's in the middle, and one time I timed the amount of time <laughs> you get to talk as opposed to how long Juan gets to talk. And he talked probably um, two-thirds of the time, and you talked one-third. And so it's kind of a frivolous question, but I want to know how you feel about that. And is it because Juan takes over or is it because Bill O'Reilly favors him? I think actually what the main thing is, is that when, when someone's disagreeing with him, Bill wants to talk to that person. And I will more frequently be on Bill's side. 
Um, and so you'll notice if I do vehemently disagree with Bill, we will talk the whole segment <laughs> because he wants to be focused on, hold on, what are you talking about? And so I think that's where some of that uh, comes from. But it's also, I've always said, um, and I, I appreciate being in this setting where I can just say like sentences upon sentences uh, <laughs> at my leisure. Um, but I do think it's, it's some of the best training in, in TV or national discourse period to, to go to have that discussion with those two every week and to say, look, this is, this is the time I get and I need to make my case in that amount of time. And it's been very, very good for me um, to work with folks who are really experienced and um, older than I am and have been doing it for a little longer and go, look, yeah, I'll step up to the line and I'll get my thoughts in when I can get my thoughts in. And uh, usually in the background when I'm not talking, you see a lot of rolling eyes. <laughs> Oh, and I wanted to say about Wisconsin, too, thanks for everything that you guys did there. It is an amazing victory. It's one of the things over the past couple of years that I say, look, we didn't, I don't think we expected to win that. I don't think, uh, like, Democrats didn't see that coming. When they were making the state house in Wisconsin look like an episode of Hoarders, they were sure that they were going to win that thing. And um, I think it was unexpected and delightful, and I think it's super, super important and something that uh, I think scares scares Democrats quite a bit. Um, and it also means on the ground in Wisconsin, there is an incredible ground game with folks like you already in place that they handed the keys over to Mitt Romney when he walked into the state. And that is really important. Uh, good afternoon, Mary Catherine. Uh, thank you very much for being here. It's a pleasure to uh, even be able to ask you a question. This is kind of a fun question. Uh, do you look forward to the vice presidential debate with Paul Ryan and Joe Biden as much as I do? Yes. Uh, I have an advent calendar that I open up until that date. No, it's, it's going to be the greatest. Uh, he, Joe Biden is so amazingly bad. <laughs> it's, like, it's delightful for us. Um, it is, it's a sin that he doesn't have to pay a price for being as bad as he is. Uh, frankly, the media is just like, oh, shucks, there's Joe again, which, you know, as you guys know, is not the way they uh, react to Republican politicians who say equally t stupid things. I was pleasantly surprised to see him get some flack for the chains comment, which was obviously disgusting. Um, and people say, Joe Biden, no, he doesn't. The, the defense is always, well, you know, it's just Joe. He doesn't know what he's saying. Well, you know what? Sometimes he doesn't. Sometimes, though, Joe, as the attack dog, which has come to be known and used as for the, for the administration, is just really, really comfortable with blatant demagoguery. And that's why I send him out there. And that's what he did. And my argument was like, look, if it didn't have any connotation, the chain's comment, then I say y'all a lot. I'm from North Carolina. Joe Biden doesn't say y'all a lot because he's from Delaware. He stuck that in there for a reason. There was a reason he said it where he did, the way he said it. And even Charlie Rand came out today and said, of course he was talking about slavery and it was stupid, which I don't like to be on the same side as Charlie Rangel, but it happens sometimes when he's smart and doing the right thing. <laughs> Go ahead. And get Mary Catherine, my name is John. Hey there. Hi. Hey, um, isn't it interesting how Barack Obama changes his uh, speech depending upon his audience? Um, going to slang or, yeah. or speaking uh, eloquently. But here's yeah. my question. Um, the economists that I've been talking to say that we're headed toward a, a really rocky time financially. We're ha headed toward a physical cliff. And my concern is, is, let's say Mitt Romney and Paul Ryan win, and people aren't prepared for the pain that's ahead. So right. we're talking about the adult conversation. I would like to talk about we can go through this period of time of pain and get better, right. or we can go through a period of time where it hurts, and it's just going to keep hurting, and eventually we just die off. Yeah, no, I, I, 
I think it's really, it's a delicate conversation to have, but Paul Ryan has always pitched it as, look, if we do not act quickly, then things get far, far, far worse uh, down the road. And I think that as far as people being prepared for that, one of the things that I think Romney did, uh, and I don't, I don't want to discount that this is an uphill battle at all. It's a tough conversation to have. It's a tough pitch to make. It's easier to hear, we're America. Nothing's ever going to go wrong. Move along. Don't pay attention to the $16 trillion in debt. Um, that may be an easier argument to hear, and I hope that people don't go for that. I hope that they look at the situation and say, okay, we really have to face up to this. Um, but it is, it's a tough discussion to have. Um, I do think that when Mitt Romney put Paul Ryan on the ticket, one of the things he did was signal very clearly, this is where we're going, folks. So there, there's not, if they are to win the election, it's far easier to argue that people knew what they were getting. You know what I'm saying? Because it's so clear that Ryan has put out a plan, uh, obviously has changed over time, has, he's made modifications with the plan that he worked on with um, Senator Wyden, who's a Democrat. Uh, I think that speaks in his favor and is a good pitch for people. Uh, the, the Ryan Wyden budget plan is more bipartisan than Obamacare was. So it, how radical is that? Um, so yeah, I, I think there, it's a hard discussion to have because it's about something that's unpleasant. It's about unpleasantness that can happen in the future, but it does get far more dangerous if we don't address it now. And I think when Romney picked Ryan, when Ryan started talking to the American people, they placed their faith in you guys and in them to say, okay, we're willing to hear this and be rational about it. And I think thus far, it's been surprisingly decent results. Um, and I think it's, it's a responsibility for all of us to be having these conversations frequently um, and, and making sure we're, we're well informed and informing us, others because it is a lot of explaining. And unfortunately, in politics, they say the old, the old saw is if you're explaining, you're losing. This time around, we have to explain and win <laughs> because that's what's necessary. Uh, yes, Mary Catherine Ty Lockhart. Uh, I, I'd like to. Uh, su suggest that when the uh, conservatives talk about taxes, uh, that they frame it uh, in the following manner. Let's just take the top rate. You know, it's proposed to go from 34 to th or 35 to th 39. So, so people say that that's a, a 4% increase, but it's not. It's it's the four divided by 35, which is an 11 or 12% increase. And conversely, it, the, the top rate for uh, now is 34 or 35. Romney is proposing to lower it to 28, which is a, a huge percentage reduction. And, mm -hmm. and, and that logic applies for all, all the different um, uh, tax rates. And, and, and it seems to me that that would be a, a better way to talk tax increases and decreases rather than a percentage of the gross. Yeah, no, I think I think you're correct, and that's one of those things where you can get tripped up on because it is harder to explain that. I think a lot of reporters don't uh, work in tax policy very often. Frankly, a lot of reporters don't work in numbers very often, and so you can end up with a, a misstatement of policy, either intentionally or unintentionally, on a lot of these issues. And I think one of the things, to me, that works when I'm talking to people who don't know a lot about tax policy um, is... To, to talk about it from a position of this is so complex and it should be simpler. And I think we want to be, as conservatives, we want to be moving toward a possible tax reform in the future. I think, at least lip service-wise, a lot of people are on board with that. And I think explaining to people, look, what I always say is complexity in the system is a subsidy for everybody who can afford a really good lawyer. So you're actually hurting people who have fewer resources. You're hurting smaller companies who can't have an army of lobbyists. Um, you're helping only cronies of the president who get strings pulled for them and credits given to them. And a more simple system would get rid of so much of that and make it truly fairer, uh, instead of just fairer meaning punishing whoever Democrats happen to not like on a Tuesday. <laughs> 
Mary Catherine, now this next questioner is uh, our good friend, Alan Wilson, the Attorney General of South Carolina. All right. Hey. Hey, Mary Catherine. I'm a North Carolinian. Don't, don't, I, don't come after me. No, you're, you're a neighbor to the <laughs> South. Um, yeah. Actually, I'm going to be up uh, in Charlotte uh, the week of the Democratic Convention at, uh, I think, a Rock the Red rally uh, nice. with some of the Charlie Daniels band and some other conservative bands. Or we're going to go up there and uh, rock it for the Dems. But uh, I'm going to be in Washington, D.C. this week uh, in lieu of going to Tampa because of the voter ID lawsuit that South Carolina is currently engaged in. Right. Over the last year, year and a half uh, since I've been elected, you've seen a bunch of conservative AGs step up to the, the cusp on the bubble of preventing the federal government from coming in and uh, taking away individual liberties and attacking the state sovereignty and, and basically infringing on the Tenth Amendment. Whether it's the National Labor Relations Board, which is an interesting concept because you've got a judicial function and a prosecutor operating in the same agency right. doing the union's will. Whether it's the EPA and Lisa Jack Jackson, uh, imposing onerous regulations on businesses by unelected bureaucrats who like to rule by administrative fiat, whether you have the Affordable Care Act, lovingly known as Obamacare. <laughs> uh, and right now, I'll give you a little sneak peek, and no one else in this room has heard this yet, but uh, some other conservative AGs and I are looking strongly at Dodd-Frank. And uh, you'll right. be hearing more about that on Fox News in the coming weeks. But. Uh, the, the topic at the moment is the voter ID lawsuit, and I've seen this administration in the dialogue, and you talked about the, uh, you know, the issue of the week, the national discussion. Um, it's, always, it's always, you know, an age group versus another age group, or one race versus another race, yep. the haves versus the have-nots. With the voter ID, I've seen the Justice Department come in and just full-on uh, assault some states using what was intended to be a good thing, the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Right. Yeah. Uh, and assault some states, and um, I'm going to be in D.C. all next week, and I just wanted to get your thoughts on how you're seeing the voter ID lawsuit as it, um, you know, as it spreads across the country. My last thought before I get your response, I yeah. was at the ABA two weeks ago to debate Jesse Jackson in Chicago, Illinois, of all nice. places, and um, a, a report came out in LaSalle County, Illinois, where the voting population, uh, there were five, the number of people registered was 520% the number of people living in the county in Chicago, Illinois, and they claim there's no voter frauds. So I just want to get your thoughts on that. Yeah, I, I think it's a really interesting issue because liberals genuinely are, argue either this is completely just a, an attempt to suppress uh, voter turnout um, or that voter fraud never existed, even though half of them I know have worked in Chicago and they've seen it. Um, it's, to me, it's ludicrous to argue um, that this is so onerous that people cannot handle doing, and frankly, pretty condescending if you're making that assertion um, about only minorities, that they can't manage to get uh, an ID. And I think it's a, it's a pretty low bar. Different states can make their own decisions, and I appreciate that that's how our different state system works. Uh, and not only that, but you have a thousand left-leaning Democratic voter registration groups, one of which in Virginia was just found sending filled out election forms to pets and dead people, um, maybe they could take those resources and use them to take people who are real people who don't have IDs to get IDs. That would be a good use of those resources. <laughs> like, so I, I've never understood why people think that's so incredibly onerous, but I also would say on a, on a broader election messaging level, I think the Department of Justice has been reprehensible at times during this administration. I mean, Fast and Furious blows my mind. Another thing we're not having a national conversation about because the Barack Obama administration shipped guns illegally to Mexican cartels who later killed a federal border agent and 300 Mexicans. Like, this is not a front page story every single day? Are you kidding me? Um, so I think that's a message that we should be having about the DOJ. Uh, during this during this stretch at the end of the election, because it's they the bad behavior has been amazing. Just as an aside, I'm Gary Hoffmeister from Indiana, and I thought that we already had won this thing on the voter ID uh, in the Supreme Court a couple of years ago. So this seems like double double jeopardy to bring it up <laughs> again. But that's not my question. My question is, I've had a hypothesis for a while. Just a quick background. In 1980, Carter and Reagan were neck to neck in the polls right up to the end. Then, of course, Reagan blew them away. Right. 
Right. And I believe that people were lying to the pollsters at that time because they didn't want to believe, or they did, they wanted to go along with the mass media that Reagan was some kind of wild cowboy that was going to start World War III. I think that maybe a lot of people are lying to the polls right now because they don't want to say that they are going to vote against the first black president. Yeah. And I just want I, to know what you think of that. Yeah, I, I do think there's some wiggle room in these polls um, for a couple reasons. One, I do think it's possible uh, that when the, the steady barrage of media coverage is that if you do not, I mean, this is the message we've all gotten, correct? You've gotten it in person, you've gotten it on TV, is that if you don't back this president, if you don't like his policies, if you deign to not enjoy watching him give a 73-hour speech once a month, um, then you're probably racist and mean. I mean, that's, that's the message we get. So I would not be surprised if some people on the phone with pollsters don't want to admit to that. I mean, that's, I think that's there is some wiggle room because of that. I also think that a lot of these polls um, have oversampled Democrats, uh, sometimes by huge margins, uh, with margins of you know Democrats plus eleven, um, which I believe the I believe Democrats Democrats always turn out at a slightly higher level, like usually two or three points higher um, historically. In two thousand eight best year for the Democrats, perhaps ever, seven point uh, distance between the two parties, I believe. So you would have to believe, to believe some of these polls, that Democrats will turn out four points more than even 2008 this time around, and they're just not excited enough to do that. I've talked to a couple pollsters who just say, look, these D plus 11 or D plus 9 and 13 are a little out there. Now, I actually think it's not most unhealthy thing to look at the polls and go, mm, we've got some work to do. I think part of the Obama campaign's issue from the beginning has been that they really underestimate Romney. In this new Glenn Thrush Politico ebook that they put out this week about the internal machinations of the Obama campaign, one of the discussions they have is like how they've almost unable to strategize because they're just sitting there laughing at Romney. Well, that is an unfair take on Romney, and it's going to hurt them in the end not to have respect for what the other team can do. I think it's important for us to have respect for what they're capable of. Uh, Barack Obama's been a very talented campaigner, and so we should be wary of that. And so having our heads in the game, not the worst thing in the world right about now. <laughs> Mary Catherine, it's Jennifer Schubert Aiken from right here Thanks. in Steamboat Springs. I have two final questions for you. Okay. The first one is, you have a room full here of approximately 250 citizen leaders from all over the United States. What is your advice to them when they leave here this weekend? What can they do when they go back to their hometowns to make a difference in advancing conservative principles in this country? Um, a couple things. Uh, first of all, I would argue, especially because I keep saying this is going to be an explaining election, um, I would get, I would buff up on the Ryan budget and the run, the run, uh, the wide Ryan budget as well. Get your basics facts down. Uh, know that the, the press is going to be misleading people on this. Uh, if you're in a battleground state and Barack Obama comes to your state, uh, he's been known to mess up on uh, local issues and uh, defense type issues in local interviews. Cause of course he doesn't do national press interviews anymore. Cause that would be too hard. He just goes to the local press. Um, so I would watch him closely in those situations. The, you didn't build that comment came at a Roanoke, Virginia rally. Um, and people being sharp eyed about that kind of thing is important. Uh, and I had another thought and I just lost it. Urgh! What was it? Oh, I know what it was. People in your community who I believe there are people out there who really look at Obamacare as a as a steam engine coming at them. They've got a situation that they put together for their family that they're comfortable with or their business that they're comfortable with. And they're going to have to make changes because this is coming down the tracks at them. Um, anything you can do to find those people and make sure that their stories get out is important uh, because I think we get too little of that in the national press. I'm always trying to find those people. And I think in your communities, you're a little bit better tapped in to find those small businesses that go, look, I'm not even going to be able to give health care to my people anymore because it's so expensive now. Um, and those are really important stories. And my final question is, which 14ers would you like to climb? <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, I, sh- I have to take recommendations from you guys because the only actually I haven't done any in Colorado yet. I just started my I just started my uh, my my climbing career last year. So um, I've been up Pikes Peak, but it was for the race, so I couldn't go all the way up to the top. Um, so I just was up there like part way, eleven thousand feet. But um, I'm happy to try any and all. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, when you come back next summer in person, we'll arrange some 14 or climbing for uh, you. How's that? I'm into that. <laughs> All right, Mary Catherine Ham, thank you so much for your time. Safe travels. God bless. Thanks for joining us by Skype today. Thanks so much. I'm glad it worked out. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we have good news. Our second party in the debate should be here in about 10 minutes. So we are going to get to have our debate. Uh, should we give him about, about 10 minutes to get here? And we'll, uh, let's plan to start just the minute he gets here. We might run a few minutes long to get it all in, but we'll, we'll try to do our best.